I'm Martina Weinhardt. I'm here at the Schirm Kunsthalle, uh, sitting in the exhibition, actually. And um, with me, uh, but far away, <laughs> like always, is Georgiana Uljarek, curator at the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto. Um, and we did it, Georgiana, we did it. We did the Magnetic North exhibition and now we want to talk about how we did it and what we did and um, what, what are the results um, of our work. Um, thank you again for joining and um, everyone else in Canada and, and in Germany. Um, the talk will take about uh, 45 minutes and um, feel free to post questions or comments uh, along the way. Our assistant curator, Rebecca Herlemann, uh, will act as a moderator. Uh, I'm very happy about that because Rebe Rebecca worked with us as well as uh, Daniel van der Erwert in, in Canada as part of the team of the exhibition and that uh, uh, is reflected uh, tonight in that. Um, before we begin our conversation, um, I would like to show you uh, some images, views of the exhibition. Uh, Roman, could you, could you um, share the presentation? I can hardly believe it, Martina. You are in the exhibition that we made together. I'm so I'm so pleased. I'm in the exhibition, but you haven't uh, told us where you are. So uh, maybe a few words where you are standing. Absolutely. Um, I want to welcome you, even though virtually, to Toronto, Ontario, Canada, uh, in the Art Gallery of Ontario. Uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario sits on Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, Mississauga of the Credit Territory. And in this very building that we're standing was where many of the artists that are in the exhibition showed for the very first time. So I am in one of the most glorious spaces at the AGO in the Lauren Harris room in the Thompson Canadian Galleries. And I wish I could show you the light wells above me um, usually light and sun floods in, but as it is Canada and as it is February, the light wells are completely covered with snow. <laughs> so there isn't just snow in the painting, there's literally snow above me as well. And uh, this is actually the room that I imagine Martina first walked into many years ago now and encountered the work of uh, the modernist artists from Canada. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but I like to think that I'm standing here when you, where you once stood and came face to face with these mountains and the snow. Are you starting the presentation right now? I'm going to imagine it, Martina, since I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see it either. So sorry. I think it's only visible in YouTube. Oh, uh, no one sees anything, so maybe we we stop that and and just and just talk about the exhibition. I I like the idea where you started, uh, Georgiana, that this was the very beginning where everything kind of started. Me being in Canada, but actually it started one step beyond um, before. Um, it's a, it's a very nice story uh, in the very ancient history of the Shirn in the year I think. 2005, I curated a show together with Max Hollein 
on contemporary romanticism and it was uh, showcasing very famous uh, image by Peter Doig, um, mm -hmm. figure in mountain landscape, um, a very famous painting in, in several versions by Peter Doig. And I was asking myself where this comes from and talking to Peter, he told me that this is actually uh, based on a photograph taken by taken from uh, Franklin Carmichael, one of the members of uh, the group of seven. And um, I haven't heard in my life about the group of seven, so I was very curious. And years after that, um, when I actually came to Canada, I came in, in this very room where you're standing right now and, and saw, uh, saw the paintings um, by Lauren Harris and um, was thrilled. So 10 years later, <laughs> or even more, when, when, <laughs> when we got the opportunity or when we heard that Canada will be um, the guest, uh, the, the guest country, uh, guest of honor of the Frankfurt Book Fair, I initially, I immediately thought, why don't we, why don't we do an exhibition uh, about the group of seven? And um, yeah, this is the moment where we came together, we partnered with the AGO and the National Gallery in Ottawa. And um, yeah, we hit it off, Jordana, and maybe you, um, you can tell a little bit uh, yeah, of your work, I mean, obviously you come from a very different point than me, the German curator, you are the Canadian specialist on the Group of Seven. So maybe you can fill us in a little bit about that. I will. I will say that I'm always thrilled when we're able to take these works that have become so familiar, so very well known, and I think very, very beloved, uh, especially in Ontario and in Toronto. and and through a partnership with an international institution, actually be able to see them anew. This is what's most exciting for me. So uh, we, I am standing here uh, in the Lauren Harris room. Lauren Harris uh, was a critical artist at the beginning of the 20th century in Canada. He really sought to modernize painting to imagine a way of painting this place in a way that it hadn't been painted before. And in fact, he trained in Berlin. So this is where he spent his youth and his, and his formal training and then returned to Canada and, and gathered around him a number of artists who were also seeking new ways of seeing, new ways of understanding what I think we can continue to be incredibly proud of, which is that this land is incredibly beautiful and incredibly awesome. So actually just downstairs from where I'm standing in 1920, uh, seven artists got together and had their first exhibition together, but they were very inspired by an artist who is behind you actually, Martina, if you just move your head a little bit like this, uh, Tom Thompson, <laughs> Northern River, uh, a beautiful painting that is beside the Lauren Harris from our collection, from the AGO collection called Beaver Swamp. And I was joking with Martina that uh, you only get to see half of the Lauren Harris so that when the Shern opens, you're going to have to go back and see <laughs> it. <laughs> but it's, it's quite thrilling to think about uh, how modern painting in Canada developed and to actually insert it into a much larger conversation because these artists, as much as they were interested in the place in which they were living and the landscape that surrounded them, they were very much part of an international conversation. And they were interested in Scandinavian artists and American artists and modern art movements, abstract movements. They were interested in everything. In many ways, art has no borders. But it, uh, these, these paintings continue to resonate, I think, because they are really quite extraordinary paintings. And what I also love about our exhibition is that we were able to also introduce artists who very much exhibited with the Group of Seven, but they may not have been part of the official group. So people like Yvonne McKinhauser and Mary Rinch, 
Um, these are artists who participated very much in the development of modern art in Canada, and all of them are in glorious display at the Shern. I, I have to say that I'm, 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 I'm quite heartbroken that I cannot see these beautiful paintings uh, in Frankfurt, but uh, I hope to do that one day. It will happen, I'm sure. Uh, hopefully. Um, Jordana, maybe um, you were talking about um, we were talking about the group of seven in general. Um, um, I remember when I first visited, when we started to work, when I first visited with the AGO, we, we spent a lot of time um, yeah, in a conference space, obviously, it felt like one week only in a conference space, but that's that's definitely not true because the second space where we where we spend a lot of time or the three spaces were the gallery, the conference room, and the vault. Maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about your holdings. <laughs> So the, these artists um, are very much connected with the very beginning of the Art Gallery of Ontario that was uh, created over a hundred years ago. But Lauren Harris, A.Y. Jackson, uh, J.H. McDonald, uh, Arthur Lismer, these were artists who were also very critical part of creating art institutions to begin with. So the way in which they were interested in modern art really taking hold was of course in creating these paintings but also creating collections so we have quite an extensive collection of work by these artists um, and with the thompson canadian collection that is housed at the ago even more so there are rooms in which you can simply envelop yourself in jh mcdonald or tom thompson or lauren harris as you can see a little bit behind me these were artists who were dedicated to also spreading and just this. just quickly the thompson do you have we have to explain our german um ah, yes. viewers the thompson collection is a private collection that is uh, uh on on loan at the ago on permanent loan at the ago that's right Sorry. And <laughs> it's it's so true and it shares a name with tom thompson not to be confused um mr ken thompson was a yeah great confusing <laughs> of Canadian art and uh, he amassed one of the most uh, beautiful and comprehensive collections of these artists. And uh, then he absolutely adored Lauren Harris. And in fact, he worked with Frank Gehry, the architect to create the space specifically so that when people entered this room, they could look at the paintings in natural light. And this was a, a really important part of, uh, of the way that we experienced these paintings. I can tell you just a little bit because I know people at home are always wondering what is behind the person speaking. And so um, the, the large painting is a painting from around 1929. Starting around 1924, Lauren Harris, um, along with a number of other artists, actually traveled to the Rocky Mountains and spent time in the Rocky Mountains and would make sketches on the spot. So if you can, hopefully I'm pointing at the thing and it looks just like on my screen. It's a small sketch <laughs> that he would have done uh, that he would have done on site. And then when he would have returned to Toronto, he would have worked it up into a large painting like this. And the painting under, underneath that's a little bit more blurry, but uh, you can look it up online, is actually a painting that he made on, um, on a voyage to the Arctic. In 1930, he went along with A.Y. Jackson um, on a scientific uh, voyage all the way to Ellesmere Island. So it's, uh, we're talking 78th parallel. So this is as top of the world, as, as close to the magnetic north, if you like, as, uh, as it gets. <laughs> and, um, and it was a really important uh, moment for Lauren Harris because it felt to him in many ways like he had really reached a culmination of everything that he wanted to paint. You know, being up there in the Arctic, so close to the north, um, he felt that he had achieved what he sought to achieve but that he was going to be in search of something more. And in fact, in correspondence with Emily Carr, uh, another artist who's featured in the Magnetic North exhibition uh, from, from the Northwest coast of Canada, um, he expresses this, this, this moment to her that he's now seek, seeking something greater. And in fact, 
he spends the rest of his time painting abstractly. So these are among some of his uh, last paintings that he makes of landscape and then spends the next uh, three, three or four decades uh, really painting abstractly. But our exhibition really wanted to look at mm -hmm. 1910 to 1940. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just, um, I just wanted to say before diving deeply into the content of, of our exhibition. Maybe, maybe we stay a little bit how we, uh, on the days we started and, mm. and um, the things we were doing. Um, obviously, um, the AGO was uh, very generous in, with loans and um, for, for our common exhibition, but uh, there were other other partners of collection collections in uh, Canada. So the National Gallery in Ottawa, where we where we went together, but we also took a trip um, to the McMichael collection. Um, very interesting um, out of many, many reasons. Uh, one reason, of course, uh, the vast collection of, of the group of seven. Uh, for me, it was quite impressive also to see that this is really a collection that is more or less at least a little bit in the woods. <laughs> it felt uh, to me and it was amazing, amazing to see uh, on one in the building, the paintings, and um, besides them through the window, actually uh, the forest. So that was a very interesting way to, to look at the paintings too. Um, but you are very, uh, I mean, you're in constant connection, contact with the, with the McMichael collection. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the McMichael too. Sure. And uh, in fact, I don't even know whether you know this, Martina, but uh, I got my very, very first job at the McMichael <laughs> many, many years ago. Um, so I did get to know that collection very well as well. Um, Robert and Signe McMichael were great friends of um, some members of the group, and uh, they were very interested in collecting their work. And they had a home just north of Toronto. At that time, it truly really was, it really felt like a journey to go to a little village called Kleinberg. It had a very German name and still does. And uh, <laughs> German name. Uh, yes. And in that, uh, in that little town, they uh, set up their home and they began their collection. Their collection was in their home and they donated it to the province of Ontario and it became a public collection that really focused on these artists and those very early moments, those very formative moments of modern art in Canada. Um, and in fact, A.Y. Jackson uh, spent some time in their home. Um, many of the group are buried there. So it really feels like a journey to go to the McMichael. The house has since been expanded into a proper museum, but it is true some of the best uh, parts of a visit to the McMichael is that you can look out the window and see the vista. In fact, I remember when I used to work at the McMichael, there is this one particular window that you can look out onto and you just see trees and trees and trees. In the very distance, you see the CN Tower and the CN Tower is yeah. the incredibly very beautiful <laughs> tall building. And so you can see downtown Toronto uh, from the McMichael. And, um, of course, their collection has also expanded as has the Art Gallery of Ontario's collection has expanded to include contemporaries, uh, contemporary art, and very importantly, indigenous art. They, um, they have uh, an incredible collection of contemporary indigenous art that they're growing uh, as we at the AGO are also very proud of our very, very growing uh, indigenous contemporary art collection. I will also add Martina because um, another very important lender to the exhibition and also very much connected with Lauren Harris um, and Fred Varley actually, a number of other artists is the Hart House collection that's part of the University of Toronto. And um, I was just, I was just saying that, yeah. 
and uh, this because but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. because uh, because these artists were very connected uh, with this this uh, organization or club, if you like, and the new building that was built called Heart House, and uh, they donated very important works. So some key key works that are at the Shern right now at the Magnetic North exhibition come from the historic Hart House collection. And these are works that uh, these artists in many ways handpicked to be part of this collection so that uh, everyone that would be going to the University of Toronto. And at that time, everyone really just means men because it was uh, only men were admitted into this uh, beautiful building. Although times have changed and now everyone can go. Uh, anyway, at the time, it was really a very important notion that art was part of everyday life. And so uh, to this day, you can be a student at the University of Toronto or be a member of Heart House and sit in the library or in the music room with these uh, beautiful paintings surrounding you. So we're very lucky that they were very generous in donating these works to our exhibition so that they can come together you know you know absolutely it hard, absolutely when they come together that's beautiful but we made we also made other uh, discoveries besides uh, besides uh, rich collections of hard house um, McMichael AGO National Gallery because I remember we browsed through um, the University of Toronto and found one very very beautiful uh, painting by Lauren Harris in the how do you say reading room or how do yes. you say yes. in <laughs> of the, the university room. in That's in right. the library that was yeah. amazing it, it just it was just there I know um, Victoria University at the University of Toronto also has a very early connection to the group of seven artists connected with the group. And so this magnificent uh, Lauren Harris um, from Georgian Bay that, uh, you know, as you are a student at Victoria University and you go to the library and you're sitting in the reading room and there it is up really, really high. And uh, I remember we couldn't even quite see it properly because uh, because it was hanging so high. It was and, so high, uh, yeah. And uh, it was actually quite magnificent because the next time I saw it was when it arrived at the Art Gallery of Ontario in the conservation lab. And uh, I remember standing in front of it and realizing that actually the painting is quite massive and it, it, it really envelops you. And I, I, hadn't, seen, I hadn't seen that painting, uh, even though Again, a little known fact, when I was a student at the University of Toronto, I took care of that collection at Victoria University. <laughs> uh, but I remember- so Canada is a really very small country. You <laughs> make us believe. <laughs> you were everywhere. <laughs> uh, but the painting I remember the most is the Emily Carr uh, that we also were able to borrow from uh, Victoria yeah, University. Yeah, that I was very that beautiful. Also, yeah. The Harris was a beautiful, beautiful reacquaintance with that with that lovely work. Mm. So now we have all the collections together, and um, we are we were so happy when these paintings arrived here in the middle of Corona safely. Um, but um, one step back uh, to to the point where I mentioned that we spent really a lot of time and, and not only on one trip but on several in this one particular conference room discussing um, okay we were sure we want to make this exhibition but um, yeah what would be the content what would be the way what would be the angle and um, that's not that's not uh, such an easy answer to give because um, right from, from the beginning, I remember we were both very clear that at one, I mean, one um, 
one thing was that we wanted to introduce the German or the, the, even the European audience to the beautiful paintings uh, of the Group of Seven as an extension of European modernism or global modernism. Um, and uh, on the other hand, um, there were certain critical aspects we wanted uh, to address and um, you, I mean, that's something that you at the AGO are also doing. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the special, um, yeah, about how your department is organized because I find that very interesting. For me, it was also very good to, to meet your colleague, Vanna Nanibush, and maybe you could uh, uh, talk a yeah. little bit about well, as, as I said at the very beginning, uh, there's an undeniable force to these paintings because the land itself is beautiful, but in many ways, the land that is portrayed is very much a contested space. And at the Art Gallery of Ontario for about three years now, uh, we are very much focused on understanding that the indigenous people of this land, and in particular here at the AGO and in Ontario, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe uh, have been meeting on this place and have been great, take care, great uh, caretakers and continue to be of the lakes and the land and the air and everything. And so the foundation of Canada is uh, based on a treaty relationship but much more before that, the way in which indigenous nations um, would, uh, would deal with one another is also through treaties. And treaties are very complicated because sometimes treaties uh, can be also with the non-human world, uh, understanding that rivers are alive and that mountains are alive. So it's very complex thought. But uh, what we decided to do is to actually imagine our department as being in a treaty relationship. And for me, why that's critical is because it means that we hold very important values at the core of the work that we do. And these are core values found within treaties. And treaties are often thought of as being treaties of peace and friendship, which means that there is trust and there is respect and there is a mutual understanding. But there's also two very critical values that for me are always at the forefront of the work that I do as a non-Indigenous curator. And that is to think about the importance of reciprocity and also the importance of non-interference. So that at the AGO, we are always working uh, together, we're always working separately, and we're always working in relation to one another. And so in this way, uh, we want to center uh, indigenous voice, indigenous contemporary uh, life and perspective and think through all of the processes of an institution, but also all of the processes of what, ways in which we showcase art. So um, it's, been, it's been actually quite a foundational shift for me because in thinking in this way of sharing, because really that's really at the core of it is this notion of sharing. Um, you start to begin to question everything that is privileged and everything that you take for granted. Um, and this has always been part of my practice to try to think about how it is that I know what I know or how it is that I have come to know something. So we center also artists, artists, whether they are still living or not. So when we showcase, for example, a room of Lauren Harris paintings in um, the same space with Anishinaabe painter Robert Poole talking about land, we start from the fact that both of them love painting and both of them love the land. And yet what comes out are very different images or very different expressions. But there's a kind of um, uh, um, place of sharing be when it comes to just profoundly being connected to a place. 
I think this is a very important point, not only sharing, but also um, this idea of the land versus the landscape. I mean, this is uh, one of the important, the most important chapters in, in our exhibition. Maybe, maybe we can talk a little bit about the organization of the exhibition. So um, I mentioned before that we discussed the, how, to, how we would like to present uh, this material. And for us, a very important point was uh, to find uh, an absolutely contemporary view to the material, having in the back of our heads the questions of our times. And land versus landscape um, is, in fact, um, the core question. Um, I brought with me some voices of, of uh, other people, Canadian or, or from the US. And on, for me, it was very um, uh, important the notion that uh, or, uh, an, an idea, a thought that W.J.T. Mitchell um, uttered when he said, landscape is a particular historical formation associated with European imperialism. Mm -hmm. And um, the notion of the land from an indigenous perspe perspective is something completely different. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, was a thought that we want to bring together with the paintings. So um, this was the core chapter of the exhibition. And um, maybe we can elaborate a little bit more about uh, the other chapters. I'm sitting here in the first, um, yeah, first gallery of the exhibition, the first space. When you enter, you see these beautiful paintings, uh, a chapter that we called from the beginning, um, Tangled Woods. Um, for me, it still sounds strange to, to hear the German titles that we found much later along the way, Tief im Wald. I, I can hardly remember them because I've, I've always missed uh, English titles in my head. So this chapter, Tangled Woods, um, shows um, yeah, very typical, very beautiful uh, works uh, and uh, that you immediately associ associate with a group of seven. Okay. But besides these uh, thematical chapters, uh, we very early on, was it very early on? I, think I have that uh, uh, in my mind like that, that we wanted to feature the most important artists of the group because um, it's very hard for a German audience to, to encounter a whole group, a whole set of modernism they are not at all familiar with without kind of singling out uh, certain stronger voices, if you if you want to put it like that. So we dedicated uh, three chapters to uh, Emily Carr. You mentioned her before. To Lauren Harris, we see his beautiful painting, and behind me another painting of uh, Lauren Harris. And the third one, we already, we already talked about him, um, Tom Thompson. Um, the other chapters, um, maybe you want to take on from that, are uh, industrialized landscape oh. and um, logging. Yeah. You know, uh, again, for me, this is, a, this is always the fascinating part, you know, because these, these works are so familiar and I have known them and read about them and thought about them for a very long time. But it's almost as though starting from the beginning without baggage uh, is, for me, uh, very, very generative. And I remember the many conversations we had with all of the printouts of all of the paintings all around us and how we began to group them. And, and that conversation between English and German, but very specifically the way in which people in Toronto and Ontario talk about um, what it means to go out, you know, uh, and, and, you know, 
for me, it also reminds me that I'm also not from Canada. I am from Romania. So I had, I kind of relearn all of this all over again. I experience it all over again. So when thinking about uh, what this pristine land may look like, especially behind me, if you like, this was also a moment of great modernization, industrialization that had started already in the 19th century. And uh, I, I, I wanted to make sure that that, uh, that that came across, which is why in the publication that we made together, uh, that's kind of what my text is about, is the, the raw resources that continue to define Canada to this day. So um, this, this the logging, mining, uh, but also this notion of being able to be and commune with nature in a way that makes you feel really, really far away, even though in fact, you're only maybe an hour or an hour and a half outside of an urban center. Um, and even with the paintings of Emily Carr, and I know we focus very much on her tree paintings, you really get a sense of the Northwest Coast and in particular Vancouver Island where she lived. Um, she didn't have to go very far to get into that unbelievable green and unbelievable uh, tall redwood trees that have become her signature work. And we wanted, we wanted to give people a sense of encounter with that, but always understand that this encounter is mediated, you know? So as I like to imagine, <laughs> Martina, is that I walk into the Shern and I see these beautiful woods, but I also uh, walk into Lisa Jackson's film, How People Live, and understanding the history of that uh, community being dislocated and then finding a new community and making a film of the return to that place that it's actually through those really critical moments and through that really critical perspective that people are going to be able to look at the Emily Carr paintings to understand that there is a sense of home that Emily Carr was seeking, but also that this is very much about belonging for very particular uh, groups of uh, people and nations um, around, around Victoria. Mm. Yeah, you mentioning uh, Emily Carr, I mean, this is uh, of course a very, important position in the exhibition, but uh, because her work is so amazing and so beautiful, but um, we also found one painting, especially that is, uh, that is even maybe one of the most important, for me, it's one of the most important paintings in the show is Blunt and Harbor, because we, we take these paintings to, to really um, follow a train of thought that kind of started uh, around these kind of uh, paintings. Um, and, and you mentioned Lisa Jackson. We, are, we have a film, Lisa Jackson is, is an Anishinaabe filmmaker and uh, she was commissioned by an indigenous um, community uh, to make a documentary uh, about um, people, uh, indigenous people who had to leave their lands. Um, Lisa is diving into historical filmic material and um, kind of, and um, a third level of the, of the film is interviews with the elders who uh, were severely traumatized because they had to leave. Uh, the country, uh, their, their land in, in the 60s and um, also were put into uh, boarding schools uh, by force, uh, things like that, everything kind of uh, under the shelter of the Indian Act. And um, we wanted to bring this perspective or confront this per perspective with uh, the paintings um, how People Live is one film. Another film is from uh, 1951, London Harbor, an anthropological documentary. And the oldest film 
um, is by Edward Curtis uh, in the land of the headhunters, uh, in the land of the war canoes, it was renamed, um, uh, retitled um, when it was re-released. So this, uh, these films are very important to have a better understanding about the setting um, of the historical paintings um, of, uh, of the group of seven. And for me, it was important. I uh, remember our discussions of how, how we open this material up to this kind of thought. And we saw in other collections it was connected with uh, indigenous uh, artworks in many different ways. And for me, it was very important to have this very, very contemporary uh, medium of film alongside the paintings um, to kind of to push the material as far as I can get it away from any folkloristic notion you could have um, of Indian, not indigenous, Indian art. Um, because I mean, what what do people know in Germany about indigenous art, and what what uh, what cultures resources do they have? Mostly, we know Karl May and Lederstrumpf and things like that. So um, this was very important for me to 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 put this in the center of our exhibition. Um, We're very. Lucky I see now in my sorry. I just wanted to add that we're very lucky that um, Jeff Thomas, who is a Mohawk photographer and artist, and we commissioned him to write an essay specifically about this intersection. Um, right. And, uh, you know, again, I will say from my, my perspective of how do we imagine Canada from without, if you like, externally, the important part is that so much of this material is going to be available in German for the very first time. So that Jeff Thomas's words, you know, from his perspective, his view on uh, his own practice, on Edward Curtis, uh, on this historical material of uh, the kinds of images that continue to be available in archives and how he confronts that and works with it is part of his essay. And it's it's really quite critical that that is the contemporary lens through which we can understand what uh, is the much fuller context in which these artists actually went into the woods, if you like, um, and, and, uh, and painted what they saw, you know? So. So looking at my watch, I think this is very nice uh, point uh, to, to finish uh, our talk. Uh, still very sad, you couldn't come for the opening. I am sitting here in the empty exhibition. Um, we are very active digital. We are talking like this way and um, we have a lot of other things that we, we keep doing. Um, you just mentioned our very comprehensive catalog, so uh, th this could be something to start with. Um, uh, we just um, are in the last days of finishing uh, a filmic tour through the exhibition that will be online quite soon. We have a digitorial. We, uh, we are producing uh, a number of podcasts and um, I can announce the next talk uh, that will take place on Thursday 4th of March uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, with Lisa Jackson. We, we just mentioned her incredibly important uh, work, uh, how uh, people live, and, and I will talk um, with her about that. And I'm very curious to learn, to learn more about uh, Canada. <laughs> Georgiana, thank you so much. Um, I I think I was just for going joining to, me. <laughs> I, I I wanted to say because I, I didn't quite have a chance at the beginning uh, because we got started, uh, but I very much want to thank you, Martina, for being a, a true partner and a partner in so many different 
ways in thinking about overcoming how we overcame so many different challenges. Uh, and the entire team at the Schoenkunsthalle, uh, we really feel very honored to be able to share our collection with you, uh, share our artists with you, because I know that uh, you are taking incredibly good care of them and we'll showcase them and share them with uh, future visitors who will fill the galleries that you are standing in. So I am, <laughs> I'm, I'm truly honored to have been working with you and also very thankful to the team at the AGO, in particular, Rene van der Everd, uh, who together uh, with Rebecca have really helped us make this a reality. So I'm, I'm very grateful and very honored to be able to be part of this incredible project. I can only give that back. It was such a joy working with you and I enjoyed all the discussions and, and uh, the insights you were giving me. And uh, we are so happy we have this incredible exhibition here. And I'm, I'm, I hope sincerely that you will be able to see that soon. And also our visitors here in Frankfurt and in Germany and maybe one or the other, or even from Canada. So thank you all. <laughs> A goodbye. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye. See you, Martina. <laughs>